A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Stave 2, Part 3. Although they had but that moment left the school behind them, they were now in the busy thoroughfares of a city, where shadowy passengers passed and repassed, where shadowy carts and coaches battled for the way, and all the strife and tumult of a real city were. It was made plain enough by the dressing of the shops that here, too, it was Christmas time again, but it was evening, and the streets were lighted up. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door and asked Scrooge if he knew it. Know it, said Scrooge. Was I apprenticed here? They went in. A sight of an old gentleman in a Welsh wig, sitting behind such a high desk that if he had been two inches taller, he must have knocked his head against the ceiling. Scrooge cried in great excitement. Hey, why, it's old Fezziwig. That's his artist, Fezziwig, alive again. Old Fezziwig laid down his pen and looked up at the clock, which pointed to the hour of seven. He rubbed his hands, adjusted his capacious waistcoat, laughed all over himself, from his shoes to his organ of benevolence, and called out in a comfortable, oily, rich, fat, jovial voice, Yo ho there, Ebenezer, Dick! Scrooge's former self, now grown a young man, came briskly in, accompanied by his fellow apprentice. Oh, Dick Willikins, to be sure, said Scrooge to the ghost. Bless me, yes, there he is. He was very much attached to me, was Dick. Poor Dick. Dear, dear. Yo ho, my boys, said Facebook. No more work tonight. Christmas Eve, Dick. Christmas, Ebenezer. Let's have the shutters up, cried old Fezziwig with a sharp clap of his hands, before a man can see Jack Robinson. You wouldn't believe how those two fellows went at it. They charged into the street with the shutters. One, two, three, had them up in their places. Four, five, six, barred them and pinned them. Seven, eight, nine, and came back before you could have got to twelve, panting like racehorses. Hi, ho, cried old Fezziwig, sipping down from the high desk with one for the jersey. Clear away, my lads. Let's have lots of room here. Hi, ho, Dick. Shut up, Ebenezer. Clear away. <laughs> There's nothing they wouldn't have cleared away, or couldn't have cleared away, with old Fezziwig looking on. It was done in a minute. Every movable was packed off, as it were, dismissed from public life forevermore. The floor was swept and watered, the lamps were trimmed, fuel was heaped upon the fire, and the warehouse was as snug and warm and dry and bright a ballroom as you would desire to see upon a winter's night. In came a fiddler with a music book, and went up to the lofty desk and made an orchestra of it, and turned, sort of tuned like fifty stomach aches. In came Mrs. Fezziwig, one vast, substantial smile. In came the three Miss Fetiwigs, beaming and lovable. In came the six young followers whose hearts they broke. In came all the young men and women employed in the business. In came the housemaid with her cousin, the baker. In came the cook with her brother's particular friend, the milkman. In came the boy from over the way who was suspected of not having bored enough from his master, trying to hide himself behind the girl from next door but one, who was proved to have had her ears pulled by her mistress. In they all came. One after another, some shyly, some boldly, some gracefully, some awkwardly, some pushing, some pulling. And they all came, anyhow and everyhow. Away they all went, twenty couple at once, hands half round, back again the other way, down the middle and up again, round and round in various stages of affectionate grouping, old top couple always turning up in the wrong place, new top couple starting off again as soon as they got there, all top couples at last, not a bottom one to help them. When this result was brought about, old Fezziwig, clapping his hands to stop the dance, cried out, Well done! and the fiddler plunged his hot face into a pot of porter, especially provided for that purpose. But scorning rest upon his reappearance, he instantly began again, though there were no dancers yet, as if the other fiddler had been carried home exhausted on a shutter, and he were a brand new man, resolved to beat him out of sight or perish. There were more dances, and there were forfeits and more dances, and there was cake, and there was negus, and there was a great piece of cold roast, and a great piece of cold boiled, and there were mince pies and plenty of beer. But the great effect of the evening came after the roast and boiled, when the fiddler, an artful man mind, the sort of man who knew his business better than you or I could have told it to him, struck up Sir Roger de Coverley. Then old Fezziwig stood out to dance with Mrs. Fezziwig. Top couple, too, with a good stiff piece of work cut out for them. Three or four and twenty pairs of partners, people who were not to be trifled with, people who would dance and had no notion of walking. But if they had been twice as many, and four times, old Fezziwig would have been a match for them, and so would Mrs. Fezziwig. As to her... She was worthy to be his, his partner in every sense of the term, and if that's not high praise, tell me higher and I'll use it. A positive light appeared to issue from Fezziwig's calves. They shone in every part of the dance like moons. You couldn't have predicted at any given time what would have become of them next. And when old Mrs. Fezziwig, so when old Fezziwig and Mrs. Fezziwig had gone all through the dance, advance and retire, both hands to your partner, bow and curtsy, corkscrew, thread the needle, and back again to your place, Fezziwig cut, cut so deftly, that he appeared to wink with his legs and came up upon his feet again without a stagger. When the clock struck eleven, this domestic ball broke up. Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig took their stations, one on either side of the door. 
and shaking hands with every person individually as he or she went out, wished him or her a Merry Christmas. When everybody had retired but the two apprentices, they did the same to them, and thus the cheerful voices died away, and the lads were left to their beds, which were under a counter in the back shop. During the whole of this time, Scrooge had acted like a man out of his wits. His heart and soul were in the scene, and with his former self, he corroborated everything, remembered everything, enjoyed everything, and underwent the strangest agitation. It was not until now, when the bright faces of his former self and Dick were turned from them, that he remembered the ghost, and became conscious that it was looking full upon him, while the light upon its head burnt very clear. A small matter, said the ghost, to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. Small, echoed Scrooge. The spirit signed to him to listen to the two apprentices, who were pouring out their hearts in praise of Fezziwig. When he had done so, said, Why is it not? He spent but a few pounds of your mortal money, three or four, perhaps. Is that so much that he deserves this praise? Oh, it isn't that, said Scrooge, heated by the remark, and speaking unconsciously like his former, not his latter self. Oh, it isn't that, spirit. He is the power to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. We'll say that his power lies in words and looks, we think so slight and insignificant that it's impossible to add and count them up. But what then? The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. He felt the spirit glance and stopped. What's the matter? asked the ghost. Ah, nothing particular, said Scrooge. Something, I think, the ghost insisted. No, said Scrooge, no, I, I should like to be able to say a word or two to McClark just now, that's all. His former self turned down the lamps as he gave utterance to the wish, and Scrooge and the ghost again stood side by side in the open air. <laughs>